It is my absolute pleasure to introduce Linda Menard. She is an excellent tiny house designer, builder, and dweller herself. And so without further ado, she will be presenting tiny house design considerations. Thank you so much. Hello, lovely people. Um, I was here yesterday doing tiny house tours, so I've lost my voice a little bit, a lot of talking. I'm not done talking, but here we are, so bear with me a little bit. Um, how many of you have already been out to take a peek at the tiny houses that are out in the tiny house village? Okay. How many of you have seen at least half of them? How many of you have been in all of them? How many of you had never been in a tiny house before today? Okay. Those of you who have not been out there yet, go check out the tiny houses. There's so much to learn, so much inspiration there. We're really, really fortunate to have tiny houses, both those that are available for sale. We've got shells, we've got lived-in tiny houses, we've got airstreams, we've got a shipping container, all kinds of small spaces. There is a huge amount of information that you can be uh, gathering by observing and by talking with people, by asking loads of questions. So I highly encourage you to do that, as well as all the fabulous other things happening today. So my name's Lena. I have lived in four tiny houses on wheels, uh, a travel trailer, an accessory dwelling unit, which is also often known as a mother-in-law. Um, I've lived in a yurt. Um, as well as having grown up with five sisters and just lived in a lot of small houses. So a uh, lot of small space stuff. And there's a whole heck of a lot more where this came from, but I wanted to share with you today five lenses, so five different ways of thinking about designing, and then some tips and tricks for things you might consider about making a small space work hard for you. Now it doesn't want to advance. It's doing it earlier. Hang on. Okay, there we go. So first, let's introduce some lenses for design. One of the first is inspiration. And this is, of course, what the Tiny House Village is about. It's what all the pretty books are about. It's what the shows are all about. Um, anybody ever watch a Tiny House show? Yeah, okay, great. Anybody have a Tiny House book that they've been noodling through? Yeah, okay, great. So inspiration is one of our starting points. Imitation is the sincerest form of flattery. We see beautiful things. We think, I want that. I want to make that. I want to help make that happen. I think that's really cool. I'm excited. I want to help make this be a thing in the world. So inspiration is one of the places to start. From there, we look at function. And function can also be considered activities. And this is where architects and designers typically start. They typically start with, what does this building need to do? If it's a restaurant, what does it need to accommodate? It's gonna to need to accommodate people dining, it's gonna to need to accommodate cooking food, it's gonna to need to accommodate circulation as people move about, as people are being served food, et cetera. There's all sorts of things that need to be accommodated. In your tiny house, you'll have a set of things that you're going to need to do. You'll need to eat, you'll need to sleep, you'll need to cook, depending on what your actual needs are. Hopefully all of us do at least those things. But then we can start thinking about some other ways to think through our spaces, and one of these is our values. What are the things that really matter to us? Do we want our space to be simple? Do we want it to be cozy? Do we want it to be a place that is serene or a place that is colorful, a place that makes us feel comfortable or a place that makes us feel enlivened? So thinking through what the things are that we value, the things that we want our home space to create for us, to inspire in us, that's what values are all about. So we can look at designing our space through a values lens as well. And then this is one of my favorites, sensory experiences. We experience the world around us, the built environment, the natural environment, day in and day out, but we don't always pay a ton of attention to it. And I encourage you to pay attention to the things that you find interesting, the things that you find frustrating. Um, we can learn a lot from the, the little tensing that we get from that squeaky floorboard or that cabinet that's always kind of off of its hinge and drives us a little bit nutty. Um, we can learn a lot from the way that we feel when we're sitting in a chair on a spring day and the breeze is blowing and the curtains are, are blowing in that breeze. So thinking through what are the things that we enjoy experiencing? 
Do we like the sound of rain on the roof? Does that drive us bonkers? This is a really important lens, I think, to look at our design considerations. And then the last one is objects. Even those of us who embrace minimalism and have decided that we want to live with less stuff and to love the stuff we live with more have to be mindful of objects. There are things in our lives. There are things that we need to go about our daily lives. And if we're really intentional about those things, we're going to be more choiceful about which things we choose to surround ourselves with. And chances are there are going to be things that we do enjoy. So this is me and my little house. My house is called the Lucky Penny. It's a 100 square foot house. It's a little Vardo shape. It's got a skylight in the top. I love this little house. And this house is called the Lucky Penny. I I was inspired by this window at the back, and that's what I built my house around. This window was enough of a starting point for me that I then found a curved door and a copper sink, and from there, it was just running with it, right? So sometimes an object or a handful of objects is enough to inspire us around a design as well. So here are some tricks to try. If you are going to be working in a small space, one of the things that you can do is to work with light colors. Whoop. Thanks, computer. Light colors are going to bounce light around, and so they're going to make that small space seem bigger. The house on the left, um, the molecule tiny house, is all white. They went monochromatic white. Now, I'm a klutz, and I could not get away with this to save my life. This would not work for me. but. I did live in this other tiny house, which is Brit's Bayside Bungalow. And this house has whitewashed walls, which makes the space really bright. So using light colors can be a good way to make that little space bigger. We can also play with this similar versus accent sort of thing. So similar colors, like this little house on the left, which is a, a tiny house called the Sweet Pea, use the same color pretty much throughout. They were using these pine boards. Um, whereas the one on the right, which is the craftsman's ship, which is Frank Bellow's little place, um, he did a lot of accent work. He was playing with different things and different materials, different colors. He travels around the country as a woodworker. I'm trying. <laughs> okay. I was asked to speak up. I'll do my best. Um, we can also borrow and bounce light. So in the image on the left, you'll see that this little house, and this is an accessory dwelling unit, one of those little mother-in-law units, this little unit has an alternating tread staircase, which lets light through, and the banister also lets light through. So the upper and lower spaces can borrow light from each other. They can borrow space from each other. In the image on the right, we have a mirror, and that mirror takes advantage of the view behind us to cast that image forward and makes the space feel bigger. I did this in a little one-bedroom apartment I lived in that had a dark corner where the stove was in the kitchen, put a mirror behind it, and it brought in light from the, the trees and the windows behind, and it really made a beautiful space in the kitchen. Whenever possible, light from two sides. This is at Caravan, the tiny house hotel in Portland, Oregon, where I live. And the image on the left is a tiny house that I finished out there. It's called uh, Tandem. And in this little house, there's a window at the back and a skylight. And it helps, as you can tell, to diffuse that light in that little loft space so that it's not this kind of um, stark contrast the way it is in this other tiny house where there's just one point source of light. So whenever possible, bring in light from two sides. It's usually pretty easy to do in a tiny house because basically you're working with a room or three. Um, but whenever you can, make sure you've got light coming in from more than one side of that building. Vertical and horizontal lines can also really change the way that our eyes perceive a space. So vertical is going to make something seem taller, and horizontal is going to make something seem wider or longer. This was my build buddy, Laura's tiny house we built right next to each other and did a, a lot of helping. And Laura used the vertical to accentuate the tall side of her house, the tall skinny side, and the horizontal to accentuate the long side to make her house seem bigger than it actually was. We can also play with long views. Um, this is the tiny tack house, Chris and Melissa Tack's tiny house. And um, he's a photographer, so the lens obviously is a cheat as well. But they're able to see from one corner of the house to the other. And by being able to see through the house, it expands that view. This is a trick that I learned from Dee Williams, um, who's a tiny house hero of mine. She 
Um, she has in her tiny house, this is her first tiny house, she has a loft. You walk in through a porch and the bed is lofted overhead. So when you walk in, there's something over you and you can feel that. You don't necessarily notice it. You don't walk in and say, oh golly, there's a bed over my head. But you do notice that there's this feeling of compression. And as soon as you walk through that space and you're out from underneath the loft, it opens up to these 11 foot ceilings and a skylight. So that feeling of compression and release makes that living room space feel bigger than it actually is. This is a trick I used in my tiny house as well. And one of the most common things that people say when they come into my house is, wow, it's like a cathedral in here. My house is 100 square feet. <laughs> so this, this really works. Another trick I learned from Dee is called turn the axis. And the way this works is that you move into a space and you move into the short axis of it and you see that you're kind of, you hit a wall, right? Like, that's it, there's not much more house there. But then you turn your body and the house continues. So in Sweet Pea, this is a strategy that was used. In the second tiny house that I built, it, we used this strategy as well. And in that house, you enter in the center of the house and then you can turn either one direction or the other. So there's a lot more house to discover if you turn the axis. And that's something you can do if you put, if you are on wheels at least, if you do your entrance on a side, or if your house is a long, skinny house, even if it is ground bound, which by the way is the term that those of us who are on wheels use. Oh golly, I'm already getting my, my notice on time here. Here we go, okay. Um, another trick is everything at a glance, keeping things visible. So I've heard people call this the come on in kitchen. Um, where, oops, where you have access to everything you need. And it's used a lot in cabins, it's used a lot in tiny houses. If you don't have a ton of stuff, make it stuff you love and enjoy it. We can also go vertical, taking advantage of the space. I'm a shrimp, I need ladders, I need step stools, but I take advantage of vertical space wherever I can. In my yurt, I hung up everything. I used one of those over the shoe, uh, like scarf and, and mitten things and put my uh, mason jars in it, and that was my little pantry. Worked great. Another thing that gets overlooked a lot in tiny houses is a landing pad. And this is a space where you arrive. You arrive, you take off your shoes, you bring in the mail, you have your outgoing mail or packages or whatever it is that needs to leave. But y'all know about mudrooms here. People in Portland don't necessarily know about mudrooms the same way you do, but you need a landing pad. And even in a tiny house, this is critical. Do not miss this step. Another trick is to tuck it in a drawer. I love drawers. I use drawers even in my refrigerator because drawers help you to fit a ton more stuff in that space than you would otherwise be able to and to keep it organized. So use drawers wherever you can. Also use the hole in the wall. Um, some natural buildings have gorgeous little niches where you can do things like put in a little, um, you know, a little moment, right, of capturing whatever's happening with the seasons. But the one on the, on the right here um, is a house that was built here in Vermont. And this couple had been finishing out their bathroom. They hadn't gotten around yet to putting the paneling over this bathroom wall, but they discovered that the spot in between two of the studs was the perfect size for toilet paper. <laughs> so that's where they store their extra rolls. So take advantage of those little spaces. They're everywhere if you're careful and thoughtful about it. There are a lot of ways to create multi-purpose space. The image on the left here, it's from a, a house, if you look up Lego Transformer Apartment, this is in Barcelona, the whole wall has cabinets and you press the buttons and everything opens up. And this little teeny tiny apartment becomes whatever room it needs to be. So if he's changing, it's his closet. If he's cooking, it's his kitchen. If he's sleeping, it's his bedroom. If he's entertaining, it's his living room. Um, super cool little space. Um, the one on the right is a tiny house that has a, a really high, you know, high functioning bathroom. A lot of times you'll see if somebody does do the bucket style toilet, they'll just have it on, on one side and that's it. Turns out you can fit a lot more there. That's a lot of space to dedicate to the throne. There's also multifunctional furniture. We've got everything from really cool old fashioned de designs of chairs that convert to step ladders to super high end uh, stuff like this stuff from resource furniture, fancy Italian stuff that, you know, a couch that converts into a, a bed. Use a working triangle. A uh, working triangle is used in the design world to talk about how to use your kitchen. Um, and what people often talk about is that we use the sink, we use the fridge, and we use the stove. And the thing to really keep in mind when your space is limited is that we use these in a particular order. When we're cooking, we pull things out of our pantry, our fridge, or our garden. We wash them up. 
We prep them, we cook them, we serve them. So if you set yourself up so that your kitchen goes in that order, you're gonna be a lot happier cook. It also makes it a lot easier to have two people in the kitchen. Um, we talk sometimes in the tiny house world about a one butt versus a two butt kitchen. So planning for whether it's going to just be a one person kitchen or whether it's gonna be a two person kitchen, you're gonna have a lot more luck if you set yourself up with workstations that use the flow of how we actually cook. Design for mobility, if you are on wheels, if you are in a boat, um, you're gonna want to design for mobility. This is um, my friend John's tiny house truck. These handles in the center of the drawers, he created uh, little mimics of those that are at the sides. The one in the, at the top there that's vertical is set up for open position, and then you can twist it and lock it like is shown on the bottom, and that holds those drawers in place so they don't move. So those of you who are looking at schoolies or vans or tiny houses on wheels, look into that. Carry a theme. This is my friend John's tiny house truck as well. Um, he was going for a theme here. Anybody pick up on it? Come on. Mm -hmm. Nautical, right? Yeah, so he's got all the brass. He's got the lanterns. Going for a very nautical theme here. If you can you know, find something that is a theme and carry it through and do it in a way that doesn't bash people over the head with the idea, but keeps some continuity and consistency, it's gonna really read well to people. People will see that and they'll think, yeah, this is, this is nice. It's got a good feel to it. Keep the kettle on. This is a trick my mama taught me. Um, most of us have certain things that really only get used in certain places, like the kettle being on the stove. So just keeping the kettle on the stove is a perfectly fine place for it to be. We did the same thing with our silverware when I was growing up. We had this mason jar. We would take the dish, dishes out of the dishwasher, put them in the mason jar, mason jar on the table. You take what you need, you never have to worry. Did somebody use their spoon? Because it's not out unless it was used, and then it goes straight back into the dishwasher. So we never had a silverware drawer. I do know how to set a table, my grandmother is proud, but this is really simple. This is how we lived. This is, this is us living in the way that makes sense for our lives. So. Um, enjoy practical art. I am a huge foodie, but there are a lot of other things that are beautiful too. And if we enjoy and celebrate the things that are part of our lives, then we don't need to have as much wall space dedicated to things that are just for show. And then of course there are a lot of hidden treasures too. There are toe kick drawers. I know this is not a tiny house, but it's still the concept at least. So this is that little thing that's underneath your cupboards, that bit at the very bottom. You can use that space as well. I know some folks who did this, they put all their electronics in there, so their laptops, their cell phones, et cetera. To the best of my knowledge, they've never been robbed, even though I keep telling people about their tricks. So um, it's a clever little hideaway spot. Um, and this other little house, this is Bayside Bungalow again. Um, she had her wine rack up in between the joists of the loft. So, you know, there's just a lot of places you can put things um, and be clever about it. I'm gonna do a quick time check. Okay, time for questions. Anybody have any? Yeah. Oh. Yeah, so that question is about design considerations in circular spaces as opposed to rectangular spaces. Um, there is a lot to consider here. Um, everything from standard building materials to natural building materials, what you might choose to build with. So things like straw bale tend to lend themselves a little more kindly to um, to natural building, to round structures, um, than things like dimensional lumber or timber frame, for instance. Um, but one of the things I found as I was living in the yurt was that I really had to think about the flow of my day. Um, I put my bed directly across from the entrance and had my bike hanging up, had my clothes hanging up, had my kitchen. My kitchen was a little um, cabinet. And there was a lot of space that was... Um, was kind of lost because of it there being vertical, um, or, or sorry, rectilinear objects throughout the house. So whenever you can, if you have a space that is not a rectilinear geometric space, working with built-ins to help maximize that space. It's gonna be a lot more time intensive, <coughs> but you're gonna have a really beautiful result. Yeah. What else? All right, if that's it. Um, I'm gonna be doing speed design reviews, just as Jacob is, so if you wanna noodle over your own design, I'd love to come and talk, I'd love to talk with you about that. You can sign up for those in the, near the community vision space in the expo space. And I'll look forward to seeing you all at the fest. Enjoy.